A very warm welcome to all my esteemed listeners. Uh, in today's episode, uh, I propose to discuss with you the emergence of the third world. Uh, now, before moving into the actual uh, historical background uh, and uh, the process of the emergence of the third world, I should first and foremost uh, make clear to you what the term third world actually implies. There is uh, some debate and some confusion pertaining to this term. Uh, therefore, at the very outset, I would like to clarify uh, the full extent of the scope of this particular term. Now, the term third world was actually coined by a uh, French editor and uh, demographer, Alfred Sauvy, uh, in an article that he wrote in a French magazine in the 1950s. Now, uh, as you can understand from the time that I mentioned, the 1950s, it was during the Cold War that this particular term was coined. Now, by the words uh, third world, uh, Alfred Sauvy actually wanted to refer to that group of countries or nations which had not specifically joined either uh, the U.S. bloc, U.S.-led uh, Western bloc, nor the U.S.S.R.-led Eastern bloc. Now, um, as you have probably deduced by now, uh, there has been a particular uh, hierarchical uh, nomenclature as far as uh, the names of various countries are concerned. Now, the first world refers to the Western bloc uh, during the Cold War period. The Western bloc led by the USA consisting generally of, uh, you know, capitalistic, uh, democratic, developed or advanced countries uh, which were uh, directly so or I under the influence of USA actually joined that particular block. By the second world actually we refer to all those countries uh, which had joined or were influenced by the eastern bloc which was led by the USSR. Uh, now, these mostly comprised of the East European countries, uh, mostly, and a few other countries scattered across uh, South Asia, etc. Now, the remaining uh, few countries who deliberately did not join either of these two existing blocs during uh, the Cold War, uh, specifically because maybe they felt that it was more of a neo-colonialist, uh, you know, adventure on parts of both the superpowers uh, uh, and wish to remain away from this bloc politics, uh, these countries together were grouped as the third world. Now, what is interesting to note is that the Cold War, as we all know, started in 1945 with the end of the Second World War, and it ended in 1991 with the disintegration of the USSR. Now, uh, after the end of uh, the Cold War and declaring for the time being USA to be the only superpower, uh, this bloc politics uh, actually, slowly, it faded away. Right. Uh, we still continue to use the term third world, but now third world does not refer to those countries which were uh, technically speaking non-aligned to either of the two blocks, but to the developing countries. Now I come to the explanation of what I mean by developing countries. As far as developing countries are concerned, these are the countries which had begun to be decolonized around 1945. Now, before I explain uh, this process of decolonization, I think I should make it very clear to you as to why certain countries needed to be decolonized. Actually, uh, we have to go back a little into history and we have to trace the beginning of the process of colonization. Only then perhaps can we understand the process of decolonization clearly. Now, as capitalism developed from the 16th century onwards, slowly those countries which had become capitalistic or in other words, industrialized, uh, specifically in the Western European zone um, and uh, North America, uh, those countries were considerably more advanced or more developed economically, militarily, um, socially, etc. than perhaps the rest of the world. Uh, 
Now, after a certain point of time, these countries realized that with more and more technological innovations, improvements in uh, you know transport and communication, and increased trade and commerce, actually the productivity of their machines increased to such an extent that very soon they required uh, you know new markets where they could sell off their surplus goods uh, at very high profits, and also such places which could provide them with cheap raw materials. Now, it was specifically this need of the industrialized countries which led them to uh, look for newer places, you know, markets beyond their immediate local markets, right? Now, this search for A, uh, markets for finished products, and B, um, the source of cheap raw materials, specifically agricultural raw materials, is what actually led to the growth of the process of colonization. Colonization, technically speaking, means uh, the process by which one country establishes its economic control over another country. Uh, the country which is controlled is known as a colony. The uh, country which is controlling economically another country is known as the colonial master. This process is therefore known as colonialism. Now, I want to make uh, this point very clear that colonization refers exclusively to economic domination of one country, uh, a slightly backward or less developed or less industrialized country, uh, by the immediate opposite, a more developed or more industrialized country. Now, in the course of history, we found that most of the countries which were, uh, you know, colonized at some point of time, uh, in the course of history, slowly, the colonial masters started establishing imperial domination, in other words, political and administrative control over the colonies, the erstwhile colonies. So now, the colonies were both economically and politically controlled by the imperial masters. Right? So while colonization was a process of economic domination, imperialism was a process of strengthening or harnessing that economic domination further through political domination. Now, uh, imperialism sometimes is used as synonymous to colonialism. Here we shall do exactly that. Many countries, in fact, almost three-fourths of the world, were colonized by uh, countries of Western Europe, and the leading country amongst them would definitely be Great Britain, who at one point of time actually seemed to have colonized three-fourths of the world, right? Now, uh, due to certain political developments, which do not strictly fall within the ambit of my discussion today, uh, we arrive at a juncture in 1945 when uh, Britain is on the uh, doorstep or the threshold of, you know, fresh election. And uh, prior to the election, the Labour Party in its manifesto, election manifesto, promises that if they manage to win that uh, particular ensuing election, they would actually work towards emancipation of the working classes throughout the world, right? And uh, that is exactly what happened uh, in the next elections. Uh, the Labour Party won and Clement Attlee became the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Now, alongside Britain, the other uh, colonial masters who had uh, equally undergone the ravages of the Second World War realized that uh, perhaps the economic gains that they derived from their uh, colonies, uh, you know, were not sufficient enough any longer to sustain the political, economic, military costs that they had incurred immediately, uh, you know, preceding this period of time during the Second World War. The devastating effects of the Second World War were such that even the victors could actually not celebrate their victory. Now, uh, in this background, Britain and most of the other uh, colonizers of the Western uh, of Western Europe decided that they would actually uh, draw out from the countries that they had colonized. 
Now, this process of drawing out from the colonies, uh, that is withdrawing administratively, economically, politically, uh, and in every manner whatsoever, uh, the process of withdrawal of a you know ruling country of the imperial master from the subject nation is known as decolonization. Now, decolonization, therefore, was a process which was conducted from 1945 to almost the 1970s um, and this process led to the emergence of what we call newly independent countries. Such countries which at one point of time had been colonies or subject nations and they had had a very long history of perhaps uh, you know very violent ruthless uh, freedom struggles in order to gain independence from their colonial masters. Okay, uh, many such countries and uh, almost, you know, uh, the whole of uh, Asia, Africa, Latin America uh, got freed, you know, either achieved autonomy or complete independence during this period of time. That is from 1945 to the 1970s. This process of withdrawal physically as well as materially and mentally is known as the process of decolonization. The process of decolonization led to the emergence of newly independent countries or what we call the NICs. Okay? Now these NICs are the countries which are also commonly now referred to as the third world countries. Now um, this is the historical background as to the emergence of uh, the third world countries. Now we want to, we would like to understand uh, which are the countries or what are the characteristics of these third world countries that help us to identify whether a particular country is a third world country or not. Now third world countries, we'll study the emergence and the functioning and the existence of the third world countries from two perspectives. On the one hand, we will uh, consider the socio-economic, political, cultural features of uh, these group of countries or this group of countries. And on the other hand, we will note that the United Nations organization, which was created uh, after uh, the massive uh, you know, uh, fallout of the Second World War, uh, uh, when it was understood that a Third World War would probably be the last thing that mankind anyway attempted to do, uh, the membership of the UN General Assembly is very significant in this regard. Now, uh, during the 1940s, the late 1940s, we find that the General Assembly of UN has approximately 30 to 40 odd members. This number in a span of about three decades will jump to 127 members. Now this huge jump is actually indicative of the number of newly independent countries who had become members of the United Nations organization. That in itself should tell us that numerically speaking, the newly independent countries were actually quite numerous. Uh, and that would make a difference in the way the United Nations organization was planning to look at world politics and the way United Nations organization was trying to look at itself in the context of contemporary world politics. We see that uh, the kind of resolutions that were being passed in the General Assembly during this period of time uh, reflected a lot of the demands that actually arose in these newly independent countries. Now, these countries who had suffered a lot during, you know, almost uh, more than one and a half centuries or two centuries of colonial oppression, uh, automatically issues such as uh, the right to national self-determination of countries, big or small, industrialized or uh, non-industrialized, um, or, you know, the question of sovereignty or sovereign status of all independent states and the inviolability of the sovereignty of even the smallest of uh, states uh, was reflected in the various resolutions that were being passed in the United Nations General Assembly. Now, uh, that's one aspect of our understanding of the impact and the importance of these uh, third world countries.
On the other hand, economically speaking, these are also those very countries who definitely were not economically self-sufficient. Neither uh, did it seem possible that in a short span of time they would be uh, able to, you know, stand on their own legs, so to say, or develop themselves sufficiently without outside help. Now, automatically, these are also the countries which suffer from uh, lack of or, you know, um, underdevelopment of available resources, both natural and human. Uh, they also lack technological advancement. And therefore, economically speaking, these are the countries which depend upon uh, the World Bank and also the countries which unfortunately find it very, very difficult to repay the debts that they take, the loans that they take from the World Bank. Okay, so politically, they are numerous, therefore their opinions do matter in world politics. Economically, they seem to have, uh, you know, got stuck in a kind of uh, an, an, an incessant cycle of poverty, wherein they have resources which are really not productive. They uh, have to take loans for uh, um, employing or undertaking developmental projects, loans which they hardly seem able to repay, right? Now, these are basically the kinds of countries that we are talking about. Now, more generally speaking, uh, we can identify certain common characteristics of uh, these third world countries. These uh, developing countries are almost always characterized by lower per capita income as compared to the developed countries of the world. They have low levels of human development. Poverty and malnutrition are almost universally very, very high in all these third world countries. The rate of growth of population is tremendously high. Also, um, agriculture and other primary sector activities seem to be uh, the main uh, sector which gives employment to people and also generates income, therefore, uh, for the entire uh, country rather than uh, the secondary and tertiary sectors, uh, the level of industrialization is generally very low in these countries. Plus, uh, while urbanization happens at a generally slow pace, uh, the rate of migration of population from the rural areas to the urban areas is comparatively much higher than in the developed countries. Also, uh, in the economy, it is rather the unorganized sector which dominates over the organized sector. Plus, uh, labor, finance market and other kinds of service markets specifically are all extremely underdeveloped in most of these third world countries. Now, uh, we have to understand that what we have just discussed or what we've just heard are the basic characteristics that are common to most of the countries which are, you know, brought under the umbrella term of third world countries, but there might be certain exceptions. Okay. For instance, uh, Saudi Arabia, because of its uh, rich oil resources, uh, has been economically far developed in comparison to most of the other countries in its category. But what we are trying to identify over here is, uh, you know, certain general characteristics that are found commonly in the countries which became independent after uh, the Second World War, okay, over a span of almost three decades. And therein, we come across these characteristics, which I have already discussed. Now, besides these characteristics, we can also take into consideration uh, a very exhaustive list of characteristics that had been pointed out by none other than Lucien Pai. Now, uh, the first characteristic that he talks about is that in the third world countries, the political sphere is not very sharply differentiated from the personal or social sphere. In fact, these are almost always such uh, states or countries in which it is uh, the social status and parochial ties 
or identities of birth, caste, uh, language, religion, you know, which determine how important a person is in the social hierarchy. And parallel to the social hierarchy, the political status uh, is determined. Okay, uh, very rarely, uh, of course, there are cases, but very rarely do we find people coming from the lowest strata of society and getting the chance to dominate the political sphere of that particular society in the third world countries. So that is the first characteristic that Lucian Pai identified as far as third world countries are concerned. Secondly, uh, he says that uh, the political parties and the pressure groups that are present in uh, these third world countries are not exactly motivated by uh, you know, political principles. There are, of course, political parties and pressure groups and interest groups, but more often than not, these associations or organizations are formed more on social cultural uh, issues rather than on uh, polit strictly speaking political issues okay uh, for example uh, perhaps uh, you know gender could be an issue or caste could be an issue around which or religion could be an issue around which a particular political party might formulate its own ideology and present its uh, uh, manifesto to the people rather than thinking uh, secularly about politics, they would try to think about politics through the looking glass of religion. Okay. Thirdly, the political process that takes place or happens in the third world countries is also not a very secular or strictly speaking political activity. It is highly dominated, manipulated, uh, in fact formed, molded by uh, such issues as uh, the primary and parochial identities of man, like I just mentioned, like uh, birth, caste, religion, gender, okay? Therefore, uh, the political process uh, manages to create awareness amongst people. It perhaps also manages to elicit some amount of participation from the masses. But what it fails to do or achieve is... Uh, participation on the basis of active secular political awareness. People participate in these countries in the political process not out of their interest uh, in the matter of exercising their political rights or protecting their political freedoms, but as a matter of protecting some interest which is rather non-political in its origin. Fourthly, uh, the political loyalty uh, of the people is also therefore based not, I repeat, on uh, the political ideas or ideologies of particular persons or institutions, but once again on the basis of such identities which are completely primordial in nature. Once again, uh, the political loyalty of particular groups of people towards particular political organizations would be based upon uh, either birth or religion or region or uh, language or uh, the place of birth, etc. Okay? Therefore, once again, the political loyalty that is uh, seen in third world countries uh, can also be, uh, you know, more towards the charisma of the leader rather than the actual uh, potential of the leader as a political personality. Next, uh, the lack of properly developed means of communication or the communication system is another big factor which hinders the process and the quality of political participation because issues of national uh, political importance or regional political importance are hardly, uh, you know, uh, hardly reach the masses in their entirety and at proper times. Also, not just that the news uh, or relevant event or data does not reach the masses, the opinions of the masses are likewise not carried back adequately to uh, the uh, system, to the government, which can process that particular opinion as per requirements. Next, we'd like to uh, discuss the rate of recruitment uh, into uh, politics. 
Now, amazingly enough, the rate of political recruitment is quite high in the third world countries. Okay, the number of people actually willing to participate in politics seems to be pretty high. But then, um, the participation in politics uh, in the third world countries creates more problems than it solves. Firstly, uh, people belonging to different generations uh, participating in uh, the political process will obviously create conflicts because different generations of people will have different kinds of expectations and demands from the government. Secondly, uh, not all people willing to participate in the political process are actually capable of or worthy of participating in the same. Sometimes they end up violating the sanctity of the political process and the stability of the political order rather than of creating a very good quality political system through their participation. Um, the next the next point that uh, I'd like to discuss over here is actually uh, the relation between ends and means. Uh, Pai believes that uh, in, in most of the third world countries, the ends seem to justify the means. In other words, political uh, programs are adopted not on the basis of merit or quality of the process that uh, is being undertaken or the principle that is being undertaken, but any process whatsoever qualifies as long as a particular political end is achieved. Now, this again creates problems in the long run, leading to political corruption, political instability, uh, too much of bureaucratic control over administration, etc. Also, we have to understand that most of these third world countries suffer from low levels of literacy. Now, that means that, uh, you know, quality analysis of political data and information received by the people is not up to the mark. Though participation is very high in these countries, political participation is definitely high in third world countries as compared to the political participation in the first world countries, yet the quality of knowledge or information that the masses possess regarding politics is not qualitatively speaking very high. Thus we see that the third world countries, uh, mostly they are densely populated, uh, culturally, they are diverse. Politically, they are volatile or unstable. Economically, they are unfortunately uh, trapped in, you know, national, regional, international debts, okay, leading to a continued uh, cycle or perpetuation of poverty and underdevelopment. These are the most striking features of the third world countries which emerged as a process of decolonization in the period between 1945 and the 1970s.